Hello everyone. Um, so I thought I would do at least one production diary update from here, from London. Um, this is my office. This is where I've been working on Peter Pan all year. I thought I should give you a very potted history of Peter Pan. Where does he come from? What, where does the character come from? So this is the first book that Peter Pan appears in. It's a book called The Little White Bird. Uh, which was published in 1902. So let's just go back a little bit before that. You've got this Scottish writer called J.M. Barry, James Matthew Barry, who was born in 1860, Scotland. And um, he's a rather odd little man. Um, he's five foot three, rather doer, doesn't speak very much, but he loves children. Um, and he likes to play with children. He lives near Kensington Gardens in London, where um, he jokes all perambulators, all prams lead to Kensington Gardens because in the day, back in the day when he was around, that's where all of the nannies used to take the kids um, to play. So he lived nearby. He was married to an actress called Mary Ansell. Uh, they had a large dog, a Newfoundland dog called Porthos. And uh, they would walk together in Kensington Gardens and bump into various children and play and and um, and have and children find him absolutely fascinating. Not just because he was a tiny man with a big dog, he could also do weird things like he he could do some trick with his eyebrows that he could manipulate them individually or something. 1897, so he was a 37 year old man, and he bumped into two children in the park called uh, George and Jack. Their surname was Llewellyn Davis. They, there was a third child, a baby, a baby called Peter, who was in a pram. And he, over, over years and years, became uh, more and more involved with this particular family. There were two more children that followed, Michael and Nico, Nicholas. Uh, eventually, after the death of the parents of those children, he sort of unofficially adopted them and, and became very much um, their uh, guardian. Um, I mention that uh, because it was because of his involvement with the Llewellyn Davis children that Peter Pan came about. J.M. Barry isn't what we might describe as a creative writer. James Barry never sort of went into a darkened room and sat down and um, came up with some ideas off the top of his head. He was much more journalistic as a writer, and, and I mean jour journalistic in the true sense of the word, not a reporter, but a journalist. He did indeed start as a journalist in newspapers, writing uh, um, sort of fe what we would now call feature pieces or columns. And all of his work throughout his life, uh, he would take real life incidents and um, adapt them and change the names, sometimes very thinly disguising characters uh, as characters from his real life. So there was lots of real life incidents. He never wrote an autobiography, but you can trace um, James Barry's life back through his work. So James Barry's in Kensington Gardens, 1897, meets these uh, two Llewellyn Davies children and a Llewellyn Davies baby. And the games that they start to play with each other, he starts to take notes and he uh, starts to formulate stories based on the play that he did with children. James Barry, in effect, did research and development, workshopped his productions uh, years and years before that became common practice. Um, I should also point out that at this stage, 1897, James Barry was already a very well-known author and a very well-known playwright. Uh, he was very wealthy um, and had uh, you know, celebrity status, such as it was at that point. So as a result of the games that he would play with the children and the notes that he would make on the games that he would play with the children, he created this book, The Little White Bird, which is a story about a character called Captain W, who's a very thinly disguised version of Barry himself, uh, who um, has a child that he is playing with, who is a very thinly disguised version of George, the eldest child, um, George Llewellyn Davis. Um, it's, it's set in Kensington Gardens and there are six chapters in the middle of this book all about a character called Peter Pan. So he's almost recognisable as the Peter Pan that we know, but just a much younger version. Then we fast forward a few years. There are a couple more children now um, uh, in the Llewellyn Davis family and they are taken by J.M. Barry to see a play in London, a fairy play, uh, a play full of fantasy and um, 
special effects and the children fall in love with it and J.M. Barry thinks, I can write something like that. In fact, I already have these fairy characters in Little White Bird. And the fairy play he calls um, uh, The Boy Who Hated Mothers uh, or The Great White Father or he's got various different titles for this play but it stars Peter Pan. In the end, of course, they decide just to call the play Peter Pan. It's a hugely expensive play to produce. He doesn't think anyone is going to produce it. Um, and so he meets with a friend of his, Charles Froman, who's a Broadway producer. And Charles Froman thinks this is great. He thinks this play will go very well on Broadway. There's a very famous American actress called Maud Adams. And Charles Froman is looking for a vehicle for her and decides the character of Peter Pan would be perfect for her. So they decide in 1904 to open the show in London first and give it a bit of a tryout. And they open it at the Duke of York's Theatre in the West End of London. The show is produced by, which was the old fashioned way of saying directed by, um, a director, a producer called Dion Busico. You might recognise that name, uh, Students of Irish um, Theatre. Uh, Dion Busico is the son of the famous Dion Busico, the, the playwright, the Colleen Bourne being his best known work. Um, and the play also starred Nina Busico, his sister. And Nina Busico was the first Peter Pan. So 1904, Duke of York's Theatre in London, day after Boxing Day, I think it was, uh, Peter Pan was introduced to the world in a recognisable form. It did open the following year on Broadway, starring Maud Adams, just as Charles Froman had wanted. Uh, and it opened again at the Duke of York's Theatre and became an annual uh, production thus beginning the tradition of Peter Pan being staged at Christmas. So that's uh, 1904. Now, the public fell in love with this character of Peter Pan, but of course not everyone could get down to London to see the show. So the publishers of this book, The Little White Bird, Hodder and Stoughton, are very clever. They take out the six chapters about Peter Pan and they publish them in 1906 as a different book entirely. They call it Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens in what is probably one of the first examples of a tie-in merchandising uh, connected to a show. Then in 1911, uh, Barry decides that he's going to publish a book, a novel based on the play. So the novelization of Peter Pan the play is produced and the book is called Peter and Wendy or Peter Pan and Wendy. Um, I have a copy of it here where it's just called Peter Pan. This happens to be a particularly nice, um, sort of nicely designed copy. And that uh, becomes a sensation, a publishing sensation. Um, suddenly, this writer, J.M. Barry, becomes um, a sort of J.K. Rowling of his day. He's absolutely infamous now. The book is uh, almost word for word the same as the play. Uh, with the exception that in the book he um, expands upon some of the scenes. There are some scenes in the book that don't exist in the play um, and the uh, ending is slightly different. For example, Captain Hook's final remarks are different in the book than they are in the play. So there's a few little differences. There were lots and lots of adaptations of Peter Pan, the book uh, which came out, sort of shortened version, condensed versions, uh, nursery versions. This is one I have from 1914, um, which I've had this since I was a child. Um, um, and it tells a sort of a cut down version of the story. And that's kind of how people know Peter Pan. What's interesting is that uh, Barry didn't publish the script of Peter Pan in all that time. Remember, the play's been running since 1904. The script of the play wasn't published until 1928. That's 24 years after it opened. And the reason for that was that J.M. Barry, every year the play was produced, he changed bits, he added bits, he tinkered about with bits. Or more often than not, the children would say something interesting. Michael Llewellyn Davis, I think in about 1905, came up with the line while they were playing, to die would be an awfully big adventure. From that, that inspired Barry and they he wrote the whole Mermaid Lagoon scene. So that was added in 1905. There were other bits and pieces of the script and various lines that changed all the way through until 1928. I think Barry had decided by that point he had done enough tinkering with it, he wasn't going to change any more. By that point anyway the children had all 
grown up and become adults. In fact, out of out of five of them, two of them had died under um, sad circumstances. But that's a whole other that's a whole other vlog. By nineteen twenty eight, he has published everything that he was ever going to publish concerning Peter Pan. And in nineteen twenty nine, uh, he gave the rights to Peter Pan to charity. He gave all of the rights to Peter Pan to uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children and the children's charity that they run. Why did he do that? Why did he give the rights to Peter Pan? Well, he didn't need the money anymore. He was he was a very famous uh, uh, and very wealthy man by this point. Um, Nico, who was the youngest of the five Llewellyn Davis children, uh, in an interview, he basically said uh, that Uncle Jim, James Barry as they called him, Uncle Jim, um, gave the rights to Peter Pan for the, for, the very, for the very good reason that it was a good thing to do, but also for the not quite so good reason that actually it was something he wanted people to know he had done. There was the lovely story then that uh, Nico told uh, the interviewer, Andrew Birkin, that uh, all that really happened was that Great Ormond Street Hospital said thank you very much. And then the following year, they wrote to James Barry saying, thank you very much for your very generous gift of Peter Pan last year. Uh, what are you going to give us this year? So that's the story of Peter Pan. That's how Peter Pan came about, uh, how he was developed through various projects by J.M. Barry uh, right up until the point where he gave the rights away in 1929. And my big challenge, I guess, in writing this show is that the original place, four hours long, um, comes from a different era when, when that kind of thing was acceptable. Um, and turning that into a two-hour musical, when a musical necessarily slows down things anyway. And all of that is, of course, the kind of research you have to do um, when you're adapting something for the stage that is a, a well-known and well-loved character and a well-known and well-loved book. Mm -hmm.